It is my privilege to invite you to today's sermon podcast. I have made the Apostle Paul's prayer request my own. When he states in Ephesians 6.19, Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, the words may be given to me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. May today's sermon come alive to you and aid you in your understanding of God's plan for your life. Well, I see Dave and Rhonda down here. I don't see Shan. There you are. (laughs) I was trying to find you. (laughs) Well, we're so glad to welcome the Ackermans with us this morning. And just open your hearts to what God has to say this morning through his word and through the things that Dave has on his heart. Uh, We did end up out on the field the same year, 1999. It seems like yesterday, <laughs> but it's been a while. And, uh, you know, one thing I can say about them is they, they have been faithful to God. They love the Lord. They love the people. And uh, you just lift them up in prayer. We are fortunate to have good missionaries like this family serving the Lord where they are called right now. Just open your heart to them. God bless. Oh, Dave, Dr. Dave, <laughs> you come and share with us, will you please? He's our academic dean out there at the seminary. And we're glad for that too. God bless you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here again with you this morning. As we were here a couple of years ago. So perhaps if you don't remember us, or perhaps if you're new, it's nice to meet you again. We are finishing up like I think around our 18th year of Nazarene Mission Service. Went out in 1999 to Asia Pacific Nazarene Theological Seminary with the Donahues. We were there for about a couple of years, and then we transferred to Australia and came back to the Philippines. Came back to the States in 2008 for some medical reasons for to help with our daughter Shan, who was having challenges with epilepsy at that time, pastored in Wyoming and then southern Idaho on this district, went back to the Philippines in 2016, served in education development and missionary care. We transferred over to the island of Guam, which is part of our field there, field work, in 2019, and then a year and a half ago, transferred back to the Philippines for the fourth time in our ministry. So we've had quite a few moves over the years, but God has been faithful. We just are about to, Shan and I will go back to the Philippines in two days, Tuesday morning. Rhonda will stay just a little bit longer for some medical exams and and doctor's appointments and things like that. So we're thankful for all that God has done in our family. Our son, Joel, lives in Boise and has a videography business. And so that's just a little bit of our family background. I have opportunity to travel from time to time. Last November, I went to Panama City for a special conference about uh, training of pastors, about 500 plus people from around the world, from all kinds of ministries gathered together to wrestle with the question, where will we get the next generation of pastors? At that conference, I found out that we need one million more pastors by the year 2030 around the world. That's a lot of pastors. The church is growing in some parts of the world. Other places, the pastors are getting older. We need a whole new generation of pastors. Just before he went to heaven, Jesus told his disciples this verse in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's a promise, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I'd like to think this morning with you for a few minutes about how this verse applied to the early church in Acts, how it applies to our ministry and the people we serve with, and how it might apply also to your ministry here in this church or or your life. So we're going to take a little flight to the Philippines. Like, I I wish you could join us on Tuesday morning, show up at the Boise airport with a ticket at seven o'clock, and you can fly with us. It's a long flight, takes about, oh, I think we'll get there Wednesday night, midnight, our time, which will be probably Wednesday noon, 
close to noon your time. So we get there and we're on the Asia Pacific region. We have seven fields on Asia Pacific. One of those is our field, the Philippine Micronesia field. Our part of the world was the fastest growing last year in the Church of the Nazarene globally. We had 10% growth. We now have 165,000 members in Asia Pacific and 1,700 churches. God is doing great things. Well, the first place Jesus talked about being a witness through the help of the Holy Spirit is Jerusalem. Jerusalem represents those who are closest to us, our families, our friends, those that we come in contact with in our community, we work with, maybe go to school with, those who are closest to us. Sometimes it's difficult to share in our Jerusalem. The early church had challenges. If you look at the book of Acts, the first couple of chapters, yes, the Holy Spirit came in power, but they had a lot of opposition from people like the religious leaders who threw some of them in prison, like Peter and John, beat some of them. They had a lot of challenges. How did the early church deal with their challenges? Just like we have challenges today in our culture and in our communities, this verse, these verses tell us in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 and 30. It starts off, and now Lord. So I appreciate what the pastor said today. We go to the Lord in prayer first. That's what the early church did. They went to God in prayer. And this was their prayer. And take note of their threats. These are the threats of the religious leaders who were causing persecution and problems. And grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. They were asking God for courage to speak in spite of all of the problems that they had. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They were asking God to do miracles in their midst in spite of all of the challenges that they face there in their Jerusalem. We serve on the Philippine Micronesia field. Our field strategy coordinator, Pastor Arnell and his wife, uh, Bing Pilling, have given us this vision for this year. It's called Rise Up, Go, and Disciple. We have uh, about 15 different volunteers who work out of our field office, which is located on the seminary campus. Most of these are volunteers. They're local pastors. I'll test your Nazarene knowledge real quick. They, they are in NMI, which is missions, NYI, which is you, NDI, which is discipleship, Sunday school, very good, NCM, Compassionate Ministries, very good. Some of these others don't have abbreviations, like evangelism, church growth, church planting, child evangelism and feeding programs and disaster relief. There's always disasters in the Philippines. So all of these are working out of our field office. We have very few missionaries who actually serve the Philippines. I'll tell you why in just a, a little bit. Where do we start with discipling? I suggest we start with ourselves. Now, I have to admit, the last year and a half, being the academic dean at APNTS, has been the most challenging time of my ministry. People always come to me with questions and challenges and problems. And when I get to the campus, I get there Wednesday night, midnight. The next morning, I have orientation. And I have like half a dozen issues I need to kind of like deal with to figure out. And it's very challenging. I don't know if you're like me, but there's times when I really don't know what to do or I'm kind of frustrated or even I try to do things myself. And I've had to relearn the last year and a half the lesson that I've, sh I've known many times from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Don't trust in my own thinking, my own understanding. Why? Because I get frustrated and yeah, sometimes I even doubt and fear and sin. <laughs> against God, because I'm trying to do things my own way, but trust in the Lord. And so one of the ways I've learned to disciple myself is in trust. Rhonda often asks me, okay, what is, what is God teaching you today? I usually say something like trust <laughs> or try not to take things on myself. <laughs> it's usually one of the first questions I ask is to trust in God. 
We also have opportunity to disciple those who are close to us. This is a group of students that we mentor and meet with every other week in our home. They, they come from all kinds of uh, countries, cultures, and we meet with them in our house for a time of prayer, mentoring, discipleship. And we often choose Friday lunchtime for several reasons. Number one, it's when they don't have class. Number two, some of these ladies are really good at making Korean food or Filipino food. And so if we have it at lunchtime, I know I'll get a good lunch that week. But anyway, yeah, there's people around us that we can disciple. Rhonda's special ministry is called Missionary Care. She is like a pastor to the missionaries. She often prays that God would lead someone across her path that she can encourage, that she can disciple one-on-one. And so God often answers that prayer as, as she works with our missionaries and, and others that are there in the Philippines, and Micronesia field. She also works in developing and work, putting together our retreats. And so these are the missionaries that serve on the Philippine Micronesia field. Most of them are either at the seminary, the regional office extension, or out in Micronesia. Just a few work out of our field office. Shan also has her special ministry. I'm glad she's gone over to help with the children because she would just love to tell you all the things she does. But she is our bridge builder. Wherever we go, she meets people. And like I was just telling the Sunday school class about going to Fred Myers yesterday. And she met the lady at the checkout stand who ended up telling us about her cancer. And it's just a time of encouragement. So that's Shan's special ministry is people. But she also works in our library, and she likes to tell people that she inventoried 67,000 books last year. Now, you know, Shan has some special needs, and that's why she still lives with us. But everyone, including Shan and everyone here, has a special ministry of disciple-making. It may not look like someone else's, but we all have something that we can do in God's kingdom. Well, how did the early church disciple themselves? This verse tells us that they devoted themselves to four things, to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The first thing on the list is the apostles' teaching. They wanted to get deep into the gospel. They wanted to find out what Jesus said. For us today, we would think about getting into the scriptures to learn about the Bible. The more that we grow in our faith, the better we can deal with the problems that are out there in the world and in our culture. Well, I think last time we were here, we were transitioning back to the Philippines. Well, we did that a year ago, January. The first two weeks of January was uh, very busy for me. I left Guam and went back to the Philippines to help get the semester started and figure out what I need to do as an academic dean. But went back to to Guam because we had a, a special work and witness team coming from South Korea. It was challenging for us to leave Guam. We really enjoyed the ministry there. Right in the middle of the pandemic, Rhonda and I were praying, how could we get this church going again? A lot of people had gone away, and some moved to the States. Our, our numbers were small. We were doing things online. We were just praying, how could we help this church? And we felt God speaking to us about working with the young people, work with the youth. So we invited the, some of the young people who were helping with music to come to our house, and let's plan 2021. Well, they came over, and 14 showed up, some of them we didn't even know. And the first thing they said they wanted to do was to study the Bible. And so from that week on, every Sunday after morning worship, they'd have lunch and then go uh, study the Bible. And we would prepare some paper, some lessons, and we would hand it out, and they would take turns. Oh, it's your turn this week. No, it's your turn. And so they learned to lead their own Bible study. It was challenging to leave that because it was like leaving our own children. But anyway, the work and witness team came. Within 24 hours, I was in the Philippines doing academic work, and then up on the church roof in Guam, power spraying it off, getting ready to recode it. So, you know, the contrast of what we do sometimes as a ministry in, and missionaries. But then our last Sunday, we were able to have a baptism service of some of the young people in, in the church. 
Well, we get to the Philippines for the fourth time in our mission career, and the first thing I need to do is develop a ministry preparation program. The Metro Manila District serves Metro Manila, which has about 30 million people, one of the biggest cities in the world. The Metro Manila District has 9,000 members, over 100 churches. Many of those pastors have come through a, an extension program that the district has led for ministry preparation. Well, we needed to bring that under the umbrella of the seminary. And so now our seminary goes all the way from basic lay training, course of study, bachelor's program, master's, all the way up to doctoral level with over 200 students. And so now we have 30 to 40 students in our ministry preparation program from not just Metro Manila, but all over Asia Pacific and the world. I also have opportunity to travel to some of our colleges on the region. Our seminary has been asked to become a hub or a resource for some of the 13 Nazarene Bible colleges and seminaries. Some of them are small, struggling. They need resources, and so we're trying to cooperate. One of those is Taiwan Nazarene Theological College. TNTC was closed for many decades. They just relaunched five, about five years ago. For all that time, the campus had just kind of become overgrown. Some of the buildings are literally falling in. And so the the Taiwan district and TNTC is trying to figure out, what do we do with this property? It is worth hundreds of millions of dollars, but they don't want to sell it because they'll never get it back. And so they're trying to figure out, what do we do with this property? We have the same problem at APNTS. We have this beautiful campus, but yet we run a deficit. (laughs) And so how can we use our assets for the ministry without selling. So we're, we're exploring leasing, and so is TNTC. Well, TNTC now has 45 full-time online Chinese-speaking students. About a month ago, I was talking with the district superintendent of Metro New York, and they have some Filipino students who are interested in taking our ministry preparation program, but they also have some Chinese-speaking pastors. So I suggested, why don't you check in with TNTC? Because your pastors in New York can study in Chinese online with our college in Taiwan. So we're trying to do a lot more cooperation across our region, across the world. Well, this is the great uh, group of faculty that I work with. Back in April, we had a special retreat trying to figure out how can we move into the future? We cannot do training the way we've done it in the past. The world is changing. Our pastors are changing. We've got to figure out a new way of preparing this new generation. Jesus also talked about going to Judea and Samaria. However, how that happened in the early church was not an easy thing. These verses tell us in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, on that day, do you remember what day that was? In Acts chapter 7, Stephen was stoned to death. On that day that Stephen died, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Everywhere these early Jewish believers went, they took their faith, and the church began to grow, but they also experienced persecution. And we know one reason why is because there was someone named Saul of Tarsus who was part of the problem. He was standing there watching Stephen be stoned. People laid their coats on him. Some even suggest maybe he was supervising it. But anyway, in chapter 9, we read about how Saul was on his way to Damascus to arrest more believers. But he had this vision of Jesus and became a believer himself. And then as we looked at in the Sunday school class this morning, guess who introduced Saul to the early church? His name was Barnabas the encourager. Well, after this, things kind of settled down and we have Acts 9.31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. The early church was growing as they went out into their, what we might call their state, the area around them. 
One of Rhonda's other ministries is called Mission Mobilization. She works with people who are interested or have a call to become a Nazarene missionary, and she helps them through what's called the Send Me Process. So Mission Mobilization, partnering together to make Christ-like disciples in all the nations. Mission Mobilization focuses on the discovery, development, and deployment of missionaries in response to God's call on their lives. If you're interested or have any kind of calling to become a Nazarene missionary, I have some material about the Send Me process out in the foyer. You're welcome to take any of that with you. We now have 482 Nazarene missionaries, give or take, as people come and go. There are two types. One, call is, one type is called sponsored missionaries. Those, are those, those people are semi-volunteer. They raise their own support from families, friends, local churches. The other type are called global missionaries, and they are supported by the World Evangelism Fund. We are global missionaries, so thank you to your church for paying into the World Evangelism Fund. It helps keep us on the field. Where do they come from? Anyone good at math? How many are not from the USA Canada? 54%. We now have more Nazarene missionaries from outside of the USA, Canada, serving from all kinds of countries around the world. Where do they go? We have 27%, the most on Asia Pacific region. We have 116. 43 are the sponsored type. They raise most of their support. And then 73 are global, supported by the denomination. And where do these come from? 70% are U.S. citizens like us, 30% come from other countries. Where do these come from? Well, this is an interesting chart. For many decades, South Korea has been the number two sending country in the world. But look who's tied now. The Philippines. The Philippines. Why do we not need missionaries in the Philippines? Because they have become their own sending country. We now have 11 or more Nazarene missionaries from the Philippines who are going out across Asia Pacific. Mission mobilization identifies Nazarenes on our fields and Asia Pacific region whom God has called to serve as missionary or are exploring the possibility and journeys with them through the Send Me process. So Rhonda's been helping with that in helping people. And last year, she took a special trip to Mongolia and took seven young people who are exploring this call to become a Nazarene missionary, many of them from the Philippines. And she, they went there for a special holiness camp meeting. The Church of the Nazarene has been in Mongolia less than 10 years. There are no ordained ministers yet, but over 30 people in the Nazarene course of study to become pastors. There were 400 people who gathered for this holiness camp meeting, I really encourage you to go to the, what the pastor talked about, your camp meeting. But it'll be exciting to see what happens in Mongolia in the next few years through the work of the Church of the Nazarene. The church is also growing in the Philippines. This is a conference that Rhonda went to for pastors last April. This is not all the pastors. This is maybe a third of the, the Nazarene pastors in the Philippines. We now have 35,000 members. The goal is to have 100,000 by the year 2030. 413 organized churches. An organized church would be like this. You have a pastor, usually a building, and you meet regularly. Every Philippine church is encouraged to have a daughter church. A daughter church is a community outreach, maybe feeding the children or meeting under the community basketball court for some activity, or maybe a Bible study in someone's home. They will have these outreaches for months or years until there's a group that's formed. It's part of the DNA of the Philippine church. And so every, although there's 413 organized, there are many more in the process. We have 13 districts, including the small one out in Micronesia. And then this last year, we have two new districts, There are plans to start three more in the next couple of years. So within a few years, there's going to be 16, 17 districts. We're talking about district planting, not just church planting. And so God is doing great things in the Philippines.
I just got this off of Facebook a couple of uh, days ago. This is the church that we have on our seminary campus. Just had VBS. And a lot of these children just come right in the, around the community. There's a community right behind the seminary wall that has a thousand people in just a couple of blocks that live right along the creek bed that goes through our campus. So God is doing uh, great things right in our community. Well, God is also working out in the islands of Micronesia. We have four churches on the Micronesia district, Guam, where we were, Saipan, the small island of Chuk, and Pompeii. You'll have to look those up in Google Maps later to find out where these islands are. Rhonda was able to go back to Guam this uh, last August and to check how things were going there and participate in a special regional NMI conference. I want to share just briefly about one of the ladies. I'll I'll put the pointer here. This is Sister Christine Mozuela. Sister Christine started off as the local NMI president of her church, promoting missions. Then she was elected the, the district NMI president. She was asked then to become the, the, re, the field for the Philippine, Micronesia, promoter of NMI. Then she was asked to become the regional NMI coordinator. And at the last General Assembly, she was elected the global NMI president. She really represents the vision of the Philippine church. They want to make a global impact. Well, last year was a little challenge for uh, some of the youth and uh, the church. Rhonda was able to check up on some of our young people that uh, we, we love so dearly, checked up on them. Well, they got a new pastor in Guam this April. And the first thing the church said is that we want to have a baptism service. Sister Emmeline, over on the right side here, is an expert in a method of training to share our faith called Evangelism Explosion. And she trains people all over Pacific and Guam and and elsewhere. And she trained her teenage daughter, Rena, how to share her faith. And Rena shared with some high school friends who became believers, and they wanted to be baptized. So. Pastor Rob and his wife, Colleen Hintz, arrived in Guam and had this baptism service. So praise God that things are growing in our church in Guam. Well, we have a church on the island of Saipan. Our former missionaries there were taught in the school system and hosted the church right on the front porch of their church, of their house. Not too big, probably kind of like this. They left, came back to the States, retired. We have new missionaries there, Chad and Angela Tafflinger, and last year they were praying for a new place to meet. Just trying, looking all over, just couldn't find a place. This April, they found this building and got a long-term lease on it, thanks to Alabaster Offering. So thank you to churches like yours, and now they're able to have a fairly large sanctuary, and the work in Saipan will move forward. We have a small church on the island of Pompeii. You can see how big the sanctuary is. Not very big, but they have a big vision. For a while, they had a preaching point in a, across the island called Ronkiti, but it was closed. They just relaunched it. And so this is the beginning of a Nazarene church, right in someone's home, across the island in a little place called, called Ronkiti. This church also had a VBS just uh, about a week ago, and I got these pictures. You don't have to be big to have an outreach and a vision. And so I just love this picture. These children in the community around this church are learning to pray and about about God. Well, Jesus also talked about going to the ends of the earth. In Acts chapter 11, we have an interesting story about Antioch. Remember back in chapter 8, some of the believers who were persecuted fled. And some of them went up to to the town of Antioch. When they arrived, these were Jew, Jewish believers. They shared their faith with other Jews. But some also shared their faith with Gentiles who became believers. Well, the church back in Jerusalem caught wind of this, and they sent Barnabas up to check out the church in Antioch. He arrived, and he found this thriving church with a vision for their community. And he stayed there and encouraged them. And he realized that he needed more help with this. And he went and found Saul, who was in his hometown of Tarsus. And so he brings them back, and together they make a great team. 
Saul is kind of the Bible scholar preacher, and Barnabas is kind of the pastor type. And this church continues to grow. There are several things that we find out about this church. There were some in this church who were prophets, and they, one of them had a vision that there was going to be a famine across the world. And so this church took upon itself to take up an offering for the believers back in Jerusalem. The text says that everyone gave whatever they could, and they sent it back with Saul and Barnabas to the believers to help them back in Jerusalem. Well, this church continues to grow. We also find out that this is the first place anyone was called Christian. There was something about this church that was like Jesus. Well, we go on in the book of Acts to chapter 13. About a year later, Saul and Barnabas have been preaching. This church has been praying. They're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they hear the Holy Spirit speak to them to send out missionaries. And guess who they sent? Their pastors, Saul and Barnabas, end up going on the first missionary journey. And you can see the lines up on this map. And they go out and share their faith, and they come back and report back how God had been doing all these great things through the ministry. I work with Pastor Eddie Morales. He is the one who heads up our ministry preparation program, a local pastor, and he teaches part-time at our seminary. He took a trip up to his uh, ancestral village in the northern part of the Philippines. I love this picture because he's looking over the cliff and he's praying, how can we get a church started in this remote area? That's kind of the ends of the earth in the Philippines. Our seminary just celebrated 40 years of ministry. Our theme is Bridging Cultures for Christ. We want to help our students become bridge builders to their culture or to other cultures in the world. We have graduates all over Asia Pacific. This is a recent, our recent graduation, 37 graduates from all the way from Nazarene Course of Study all the way up to the highest PhD. And we serve this massive city of, of Manila. Ever since COVID, though, we've had to rethink how we do our education. And so now we have all of our classes are offered by Zoom. We have 50% of our students online on the screen and 50% in the classroom. I want to share a brief story, uh, stories about some of these. Mary Jubilin was a nurse working in Norway. She came back to the Philippines, married Celso, and now they have this beautiful girl. They both just graduated. Mary Jubilin wrote her thesis about how Filipino nurses in Norway can share their faith with their patients and pray with them. Very well done. And Celso graduated with a Master of Divinity degree. I saw on Facebook that they just arrived in Japan and are now Nazarene pastors of a Filipino-Japanese church about an hour north of Tokyo. Jomer is a Wesleyan pastor about an hour north of Manila. He is working on his master's thesis on the Gospel of Mark. He's exploring how the disciples in Mark are blind to who Jesus is. They, they can't figure out this Jesus. Yet some people who are blind actually see who Jesus is and become believers and are healed. Jomer is legally blind. He takes all of his classes on the computer by Zoom. And he is a, doing a great job. Uh, he's a Wesleyan. We cooperate with the Wesleyans and Free Methodists. We have professors from those denominations. And recently, we are working with the Global Methodist Church, which is the conservative breakoff of the United Methodists. Maybe you followed some of that news recently. And they are looking for a seminary to train their students in the Philippines. And so they're starting to send their students to our seminary. We have become a hub for Wesleyan holiness denominations in the Philippines. Grace and Peter are graduates of Korea Nazarene University. They wanted to study more and to study in English. And so they came to our seminary to work on another degree. All of our students, master's degree and above, have to study in English. Sometimes it's very challenging. But Peter and Grace are doing a great job. I'm hoping that they will be ordained this, this next year in the Philippines. Uh, it's not easy for all of our students, however. We have students from Myanmar. Do you know what's happening in Myanmar these days? Civil war. It's really tough. And so our students 
don't want to go back home because if they do, they will be forced into the army and then they'll have to fight their own families. And so they're staying in the Philippines and taking every course they can. And some of them are actually now applying to become refugees. We were traveling through northern Washington about four years ago to a small town called Republic and uh, uh, sharing our, our deputation service. And the pastor was asking me about questions, asking about our seminary. I was not teaching there at the time, but I, I answered her questions, and she ended up enrolling. And now Pastor Jennifer is halfway through her Master of Divinity. We have students even in the U.S. who are enrolling in our seminary. This is my dear friend, Pastora Mary Lou, right next to Rhonda. She has been taking classes in our extension program. She was a part of a church about an hour north of Manila, and the pastor left. God was working in her life, and she ended up becoming the pastor. And she will soon be ordained. Guess how old she is? She's over 70 years old and pastoring her local church. You are never too old to be in ministry or even to be called to be a pastor. So we are exploring these new methods of theological education, but at the top of the list, we want our students to become like Jesus Christ. What is it that keeps a person in ministry? Pastor, it's not not the degrees or your head knowledge, it's your heart. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we want our students to be formed into. Every class, we want them to be involved in ministry and also growing in their character. I keep reminding faculty, what in this class helps the students to become like Jesus Christ? Every semester, our students in the undergraduate and graduate programs have to be involved in local church ministry and a spiritual formation class. We're also exploring new methods. This picture on the right is me trying to be a movie star. No, no, actually not. (laughs) We are developing a program called SENT program. And it is designed for people who are not able to come to be with us in person or on a regular schedule. We're developing videos. And so I was recording a video, 35 sessions of 10 to 15 minutes each. And this is for overseas Filipino workers. We There are 10 million OFWs around the world. They live and work in just about every country around the world. They work six or seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day. They will send their money back to their families in the Philippines, hoping that someone maybe can get through college, get a good job, and raise the whole family economically. Many of these 10 million people are Nazarenes, and they want to study, but they cannot take our regular classes. But they can watch on their phone a 10 to 15 minute video on the Gospel of Mark. And then they can meet maybe once a month or every couple of months with a mentor to discuss the material. They can get through the Nazarene course of study. It may take them 10 years, but they can be in ministry right where they are. They are in countries where we can't send missionaries like Saudi Arabia and other places, but they are already there. They're believers. They're Nazarenes. They want to be in ministry. And so we're going to train them right where they are. We have about 50 in the program right now. We hope to have thousands in the coming years. Well, we come to the, towards the end of the book of Acts. Paul the Apostle, as he goes by later, has been all over the Roman Empire, planting churches. He went out with Barnabas and later Silas and Timothy and others. And the church has been growing. And Paul goes back to Jerusalem. And we read about it in these verses. After he had greeted them, the believers in Jerusalem, He began to relate one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles. The word Gentiles in the original language can mean nations, peoples, through his ministry. And when they had heard, they began glorifying God. Where did all of that start? Back in the church in Antioch. I want to challenge you to think about that church in Antioch. Just a group of believers. God was working in their lives. They were filled with the Spirit growing. They had a vision for the lost around them and around the world. So I want to challenge you to pray for three things in your church. One, pray for God's presence to grow. 
that when you gather together for worship, study, fellowship, that you know God's presence is there. The Holy Spirit is working in you and you are growing deeper in your faith. Number two, pray for God's vision for the lost to grow in you. Your Jerusalem, whatever it might be, your Judea, Samaria, that God will give you a vision for the people right around you. And then third, pray for God's call for workers to be sent. Now, not everyone in Antioch went. Most of the church stayed right there and prayed and gave and uh, encouraged and grew themselves. But they did send out Saul and Barnabas. There may be someone in this church that God is calling. I've had some interesting experiences. This is our last church. I think it's number 40. I've had a busy couple of months, 12,000 miles. I've had a really interesting experience. It started in Molala, Oregon, about two months ago, Sunday morning. I was really interested to find out where that pastor came from. Guess where he came from? Right in that church. The pastor left. God was working in this layman's life, calling him into ministry. And the church recognized that, and now he's the pastor of that church. I've had about seven or eight churches the last couple of months where the pastor came right from within that church. There might be someone in this church that God is calling into ministry, in this church, or maybe to go out out further. And so just pray that God will call workers into his harvest field right here in this church. I'd like to say a a closing prayer for your church. Lord, I thank you for uh, this church here in Mountain View. I thank you for how you're working in their midst. I thank you for their new pastor, for all who serve on staff. I thank you for their leaders. I thank you, Lord, that your spirit is indeed working in their midst, and you are here today. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them and draw them close to you in the coming weeks and months. Lord, I also ask that you would work in the lives of those who may be challenged and you're, you're, you're calling them and they just have been resisting or not knowing what to do or what that might look like. And so I pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in this church. We also pray for our brothers and sisters in Asia Pacific. We know it's not easy in many places today. There's persecution, there's political problems, there's economic challenges, there's secularism and atheism, many other challenges, but yet you're working there. We pray that your spirit will will just continue to work in your church globally around the world and through our brothers and sisters in the Church of the Nazarene. We just commit this to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for joining today's sermon podcast. You can find a copy of today's sermon as well as other sermons and the sermon outline from today on our church's website, www.mvcnaz.org. It is my prayer also that you will seek out a church home that recognizes the authority of the Bible.